I first met Solomon seven years ago. Nothing could have prepared me for that moment. He was in his 50s, naked, except for a ragged blue cloth tied around his waist. This metal chain, one meter long, tied around his ankle. This one meter was the radius of his life. I found Solomon in what's called a spiritual healing center, about three hours west of Accra, Ghana's capital. Chained to a tree, this is where Solomon slept, where he ate, where he defecated. This is where he endured the beating sun, allowed a shower only once a month. This is how Solomon lived for more than nine years. Why? Simply because he has a mental health condition. His parents thought he was possessed by the devil or cursed, and they didn't know what else to do, so they brought him to this place for worship. And instead, he ended up in chains. If I hadn't seen it with my own eyes, I would never imagine that anyone would treat a fellow human being in this way. But you don't have to travel all the way to Ghana to witness such inhumanity. Right here, about 30 kilometers from this very stadium, is the largest mental hospital in all of Asia. I vividly remember the first time I went to Thane Mental Hospital. Dozens of people lay on the floor, some moaning or wailing, others motionless. The women, they were wearing shabby green and pink uniforms, their heads shaven from the rampant lice. The stench of urine was overpowering, and the corridors echoed with people calling out to me, Didi, mujhe ghar le jao. Sister, take me home. It's the last place I thought anyone would want to go to feel better. As one woman during our research told us, we're treated worse than animals. For more than a decade, I've been investigating human rights abuses against people with disabilities and working with them to advocate for their rights. And in the hundreds of interviews I've done, the one constant and haunting refrain I've heard again and again from people with disabilities is, I'm treated as less than human. That's exactly what I understood when I went to Asha Kirin, a residential institution on the outskirts of Delhi. There, more than a thousand men, women, and children are confined like cattle, despite a capacity of 500. Most of the children there don't go to school or play with toys or even the other children. They just lie on thin mats on the floor all day long. On my last visit in April, I met Amin, a seven-year-old with Down syndrome. Amin was brought there as a young child. When his parents separated, they each decided to keep one of his siblings, whom they considered a healthy child, and they asked a non-governmental organization to make arrangements for Amin. Like many people with disabilities in Asha Kirin, Amin will likely never leave. There are one billion people with disabilities around the world. That's one in seven of us. The United Nations Treaty on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, adopted by more than 175 countries, including India, sets out that every person with a disability has the same rights as any other citizen. But as the situation in Asha Kirin demonstrates, the laws may be in place, but quite often, the reality is different. So why are the laws failing? The government needs to enforce the law, and the government also needs to invest in people with disabilities and the services to support them and their families. If not, too often, people with disabilities will remain hidden in their homes, locked up in institutions, denied the most basic human rights that so many of us take for granted. 
the right to go to school, to be free from violence, the right to be a part of our communities. And it's this exclusion that's just as dehumanizing as being put in chains. The government has a role to play in ensuring inclusive communities, and so do we. You might be thinking, the situation of Solomon or Ammon is so far removed from my life, how does it relate to me? But the exclusion that they experience is because of our actions and beliefs. Why do we exclude people with disabilities? I offer three reasons. Shame, fear, pity. The shame associated with disability is deeply ingrained. In India, for example, parents might hide the fact that one child has a disability because it might jeopardize the marriage prospects for other children. Fear, fear of what we don't know or understand, fear of someone who looks different or acts differently, fear of what others might think. Pity. I often hear people say, that someone is suffering from a disability. I've met so many people with disabilities around the world who are not suffering because of their physical or mental health condition. The suffering, the isolation, the abuse, the neglect they experience is because of how the rest of society treats them. Let's think about our own actions. How many of us have seen someone in a wheelchair and looked the other way? avoiding eye contact. Or maybe we've stared at them, a strange mix of discomfort and curiosity. How many of us would feel comfortable telling our employers that we have dyslexia or depression, or telling a friend that we have the onset of dementia? Does that make us feel less than human? Or are we worried that if we disclose that we have a disability, we might be treated as less than human? Disability is taboo, but it's a part of life. It's a part of our human diversity. Things are changing, and people with disabilities are driving this change, transforming policies and perceptions. I want to take you back to Ghana, to Solomon. For years, his pleas to go home went unanswered. That is, until last June. With mounting pressure from my organization, together with local disability rights advocates, the Ghanaian government went to the Spiritual Healing Center and sawed these very chains off of Solomon and 15 others shackled in the camp, including two 12-year-old girls. In October last year, the government went further, announcing a national ban on shackling. I tracked down Solomon that week. He immediately recognized me, smiled, and said, now I'm free. Not only in Ghana, but in many countries, governments are changing laws to meet the standards set by the UN Treaty. But the laws are not enough. We might have the strongest laws and policies outlawing discrimination and banning shackling, but what's even more important is changing attitudes. And that's where all of us come in. We have the collective responsibility of treating a person with a disability just like anyone else, with the same rights and dignity. Together, we have the power to break these chains. Thank you.